Hello everyone, to the lecture series on basic cognitive processes, I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. Now, in the last few lectures, we have been talking about memory. We have talked about sensory memory, we have talked about short term memory and we have talked also about a concept of working memory. Now, the sensory memory and the short term and the working memories are still much uh, smaller stores, are still stores which uh, hold information for not more than a few seconds uh, and in that sense they are more uh, akin to uh, you know memory that comes and goes and it kind of in a more dynamic setup. But what is that aspect of memory which we referred to in the first lecture as providing us the sense of continuity of life that provides us the sense of being and provides us the sense of that we are x y or z. Now, that kind of memory is basically referred to as what is called the long term memory. Now, long term memory can be the memory of anything from just a few minutes past to your entire life to a few decades old anything any information that you remember from so long ago. Also, uh, long term working memory can both be a memory of events, example, your birthday when you were 6 years old, your let us say uh, if uh, you got selected to a particular uh, position or you got selected for a uh, you know great college or something like that or say for example, the memory of when India won the world cup in uh, you know 2000, those kind of things are memories of events or memories of episodes uh, that basically comes under what is called declarative memory. Now, long term memory also by the way includes the hold of skills that we have learned that we pick up while growing up. Say for example, when you first learn to uh, ride the bicycle or uh, a bike or a car or those kind of things, well, you just uh, you know learn to draw, you uh, uh, learned say for example, even things like you know uh, uh, the way you uh, learn to uh, speak and those kind of things. So, procedural uh, memory basically is the memory for all the skills uh, you have gained over a period of time. So, long term memory in that sense includes everything that you can say that this is uh, something that I know. All of your knowledge is basically pretty much in your long term memory. Now, uh, what happens if uh, say for example, your long term memory is damaged or say for example, you cannot remember uh, items uh, for uh, you know uh, more than a very small amount of time. Here is an excerpt from Goldstein's book about a conversation, I think this is uh, from Oliver Sacks's book, uh, it is basically about a conversation with a uh, patients of amnesia from patient of amnesia and then the author is kind of talking to this person and he basically asks him you know what year is this what is the time and this person basically has uh, had amnesia since the age of 19 it seems. So, uh, it kind of uh, the person asks him what year is this and this patient replies it is 45 and he is uh, telling a few uh, uh, incidents that happened in the year 1945. And this person asks what is your age and the person and this guy replies that I am 19 years of age. Now, a lot of time has passed and this person is obviously not 19 uh, at the moment, it is many years later uh, that this conversation is happening. Uh, so, uh, our uh, friend here, the uh, author who is having this conversation, it thrust, thrusts the mirror towards him. It is kind of an, a rude thing to do, uh, but he thrusts the mirror uh, towards him and he says he kind of uh, you know regrets doing that and this patient gets really perplexed, uh, he gets really uh, you know uh, panicked at the sight of himself in the mirror and he has no memory uh, since the time he was 19 to the time when say for example, he is 38 or 45 or whatever uh, point in time this conversation has been happening. Now, imagine something like this happening to uh, you know m uh, one of ourselves, uh, how would it feel say for example, if the entire chunk of life is gone and it is absent and you cannot really remember anything about it. That will be uh, rather hard I would say. Another conversation with the same person uh, say for example, uh, you know uh, the this uh, uh, guy the author here is trying to make him remember something. So, he kind of says he tells to him that you remember telling me about your childhood growing up in Pennsylvania working as a radio operator and those kind of things the how your brother got engaged to a girl in California. So, this person remembers yes you are right, but wait I did not tell you that this information that you are telling me is right, but I do not have a memory of telling you all of this. 
Now, this is where this person, uh, the patient gets uh, really perplexed. So, the author is telling him a story that a man, uh, I'll tell you a story that a man went to his doctor complaining of uh, memory lapses and after he's told the doctor everything and the doctor says something, uh, the patient says, what kind of lapses are you talking about? So, it might be possible that the patient or amnesia does not remember anything past a conversation and in that sense the person is living in that very short span of time probably living that shorter, uh, shorter span of time again and again because no new memories are being formed. I remember a movie, uh, I think uh, Drew Barrymore and Andy Adam Sandler uh, uh, appeared in this and the movie was called 51 First Dates. Uh, in that movie also you will find that you know the patient uh, Drew Barrymore uh, or sorry probably Adam Sandler suffers uh, from a particular injury in action and he suffers this kind of memory loss. And the entire, uh, uh, you know, movie you will see that them uh, reliving that uh, whole uh, time of the first date they had because this accident probably happened just after the first date was completed. Now, these kind of movies and there are many movies on uh, these kind of things you will find, uh, you know, in Hollywood and probably in Bollywood as well. But what do these uh, informations tell us that memory is a very integral part of our lives and it is uh, something that uh, uh, kind of forms the core of uh, our uh, existence and personalities. So, let us now come back and try and define what long term memory is. We have been talking about what long term memory is about. Uh, so, long term memory or long term memory processes are the processes and it is a system that is responsible for storing information for longer periods of time. Uh, relevant information might not be uh, forgotten ever, but most information is stored there for a relatively longer period of time, at least as compared to the short term or working memory or sensory memory things. It is supposed to be an archive of information about past events in our lives and knowledge about everything we have learned. The span of uh, long term memory as opposed to the span of working memory or short term memory as you have seen in the last lectures can be huge. It is probably very difficult to measure what the span of uh, long term memory is actually. Uh, here and you can see a demonstration from Goldstein's book wherein this person is trying to remember what long term memory is. The first aspect you know when the person just sits down on the chair is probably still in the short term memory maybe it is going to be there up to few seconds or maybe a minute at max. But everything else since uh, the most recent 5 minutes uh, to as long as 10 years ago is all in the long term memory. So, this is what I am going to be talking about in uh, today's lecture that what is this, what are the processes uh, with which we store memories, uh, we make memories in the long term uh, memory and what are the processes involved in uh, you know taking out information from there and using it and so on and so forth. Now, what is the uh, again uh, difference between short term and long term memory? You can see say for example, you know you meet somebody uh, and that person uh, you know is telling you about uh, some particular episode. Uh, obviously, you are talking to this person, you are making some judgments, but in your long term memory you are kind of trying to have all that information as well. Here in this uh, conversation uh, there is a uh, Cindy and, Ton and Tony talking. Uh, so, Cindy tells that you know Jim and I went to see the first uh, James Bond movie. At the short term at least the information that is being accessed or activated by Tony is the fact that you know Cindy went to the movie uh, with Jim, but in the long term memory and there is this interaction obviously happening all this information about what James, on, James Bond is, what that movie was about. I have also seen that movie and judgments and decisions that see Cindy is probably a James Bond fan and those kind of things are all happening at the same point. So, all of that information is basically being drawn from the long term memory. It is sometimes, it is obviously coming to the short term memory when he is actively thinking about that and then going back to long term memory. So, this is something which you have to uh, uh, really you know remember that uh, whatever our common sense conception of memory is, is uh, more uh, ef uh, basically efficiently uh, portrayed in the concept of long term memory. Any memory that we uh, may talk about as lay persons is generally uh, and more often than not long term memory. Here is a demonstration by Murdoch in, in which he wanted to test the long term memory of uh, participants and you can also use this demonstration of uh, on any of your friends. So, the idea is that there are these uh, 15 words here and you try and repeat these words to one of your friends uh, at the rate of one word every two seconds and after that you ask this person to recall and rewrite those words or recall those words uh, one after another in any order possible. So, the procedure will be uh, termed to as free recall. 
Now, when Murdoch did this experiment with a large number of participants and he plotted the percentage recall for each of these words uh, against the words position in its in a particular in the list, he obtained what is called a serial position curve. So, what is the serial position curve? Serial position curve looks something like this and wherein you will see that words in the first to fifth position uh, basically are remembered best and then what is remembered best is the words in the most recent conditions. The words say for example, in 18, 19, 20, position or first, second and third positions are those that will receive the best recall. You will see the words uh, which were told first uh, are obviously remembered better, but the best uh, or the most uh, recalled word are those uh, who which are said most recently. Now, Murdoch's uh, serial position curve indicates that the memory is better for words at the beginning of the list and at the end of the list than for words in the middle of the list. So, if you uh, look at this figure here, the words in the middle of the list are the ones which are least remembered. Superior memory for stimuli presented in the beginning of the list has been termed to as a phenomena called the primacy effect. A possible explanation of the primacy effect or uh, is basically that the participants did have the time to rehearse these words uh, in the LTM. So, when I am saying, when I am starting to say these lists, uh, this list of words, say for example, I am starting to say, let us say, uh, barricade, children, diet, ground, uh, uh, folio and those kind of things. As I am saying these words at the rate of, uh, you know, uh, one word every two seconds, you have this chance because I have told you that I will ask you to recall these words later to rehearse these words. You are probably also repeating these words at the same time while I am saying them in order to not forget them. But when uh, more words are added to the list, your uh, rehearsal kind of uh, becomes lesser and lesser. The words at the beginning of the list received your 100 percent attention and received the best rehearsal, but the words which came after the second, third, fourth, fifth and tenth, twelfth words, they received proportionately lesser amount of rehearsal and lesser amount of attention and that is why the recall kind of you know decreases uh, steadily uh, while you are reaching towards the middle of the list. Now, the idea for more rehearsal of words, uh, Devi Randus wanted to test it and he again derived a, re a serial position word by presenting a list of 20 words at the rate of one word every five seconds giving enough time for rehearsal and then he asked his participants to just write down all of the words. The serial position curve, the red one here uh, you will see uh, basically came out pretty much the same as the uh, curve that was gained by Murdoch. Now, Rundus actually he added a small twist to his experiment by asking his participants to study the list as it was being presented by repeating words out aloud during the 5 uh, second interval between words. So, he said that while I am you know repeating uh, a word every 5 seconds, during that 5 seconds you repeat whatever words I have already said. They were not told which specific words to repeat, they could probably uh, the participants could, were free to repeat whatever words they would want to. Here is uh, you can see uh, the performance. The dashed curve here which you see the blue one uh, basically indicates how many times each word was repeated and it was found that the how many times the number of times each word was repeated very striking resemblance to the first half of the serial position curve. So, you will see this. If you notice the first half of the serial position curve uh, tells you that the f uh, words in the beginning of the list were remembered better. Now, because you know that uh, which are the words most uh, rehearsed, you see that these are actually the words which were most rehearsed. So, the amount of rehearsal for the words at the end of the list is the lowest, the amount of rehearsal for the words at the beginning of the uh, list is highest and in that sense this amount of rehearsal may then very well be uh, you know used as uh, the reason to account for the primacy effect. Now, this is how you, you know, you uh, can see that very cleverly designed experiments can, can tell you a lot about mental phenomena. Now, superior memory you have seen also in the same figure here that there is very good memory, there is very good recall for words at the end of the list. So, superior memory for items at the end of the sequence or the list is called the recency effect. One possible explanation for the recency effect is that uh, some of these items are still present in the short term memory that is there, but Glanzer and Cunitz wanted to test this idea. So, they first derived a serial position curve in a usual way uh, and I will show you that figure very soon uh, and then what they did was in another experiment they measured the curve again after having participants count backwards for 30 seconds right after hearing the last word of the list. So, that there was no rehearsal uh, or no maintenance happening for these words at the end of the list. 
Discounting prevents the rehearsal and allowed time for information to be lost uh, out of this uh, short term memory and then this delay caused by counting uh, eliminated the recency effect. So, there is no recency effect in the uh, curve that uh, you see is obtained by Glenzer and Kunitz. So, you see you can obviously manipulate uh, the amount of rehearsal that is gained and that amount of rehearsal is certainly going to you know uh, play with the amount of recall that is going to happen. Now, let us talk about how do you store information in long term memory, how do you push information to the long term memory, we will talk about that now. Now, all three types of coding, auditory coding that is by virtue of sound, visual coding by virtue of visual perception and semantic coding that is by analysis of meaning can take place for the long term memory as well. But the preferred coding strategy for uh, information in the long term memory has to be semantic coding. Because if you analyze the words for their meaning, if you analyze how new information is related to the older knowledge that you have already had, that will basically uh, you know very deeply plant the new information and your recall will be better and you might be able to re uh, remember this information a relatively longer time. Now, semantic coding is basically illustrated by the kind of errors that people do, uh, the kind of errors they mistake in these kind of recall tasks which involve the long term memory. Say for example, misreading words like tree as bush will indicate that the person got the gist of the meaning of what the tree is, uh, but he probably did not remember the exact word, kind of confusing two words which mean alike. So, maybe that is why you got confused between the tree and the bush. So, you are not remembering the exact word, but you are remembering the gist of the idea. That is how semantic encoding is achieved. A study by Sachs in 1967 demonstrated the importance of meaning in the, the long term memory. Sachs had participants listen to a tape recording of a message and then measured their recognition memory to determine whether they remember the exact wording of the sentence in the passage or the general meaning of the passage. This demonstration of or say for example, when you really want to check for somebody's long term memory, one of the ways to do that is basically testing for recognition memory. Recognition me memory basically is just that uh, if you have remembered a list, I will give you a couple of uh, uh, prompts, I will give you some cues and then I will basically ask you whether these two items were the items that were presented in the initial list that I asked you to memorize. That is pretty much what uh, the recognition memory is about. And this is different from recall memory because recall memory I am not giving you any cue. I am just asking you to remember right out of your memory whatever I had told you earlier. If you have played or uh, if you have uh, you know uh, watched uh, say for example, uh, TV uh, programs such as KBC, you will see there is they are basically checking for the recognition memory and not uh, really the recall memory. Now, an experiment similar to what Sachs did, well, I am going to tell you a story, uh, uh, a very small story and then I will take a bit of a test. So, in Holland, a man named Lippershey was an eyeglass maker, one day his children were playing with some lenses, they discovered that things seem very close if two lenses are held about a foot apart. Lippershey began experimenting and his spyglass attracted much attention. He then sent a letter about it to, the, uh, to Galileo, an Italian scientist. Galileo at once realized the importance of the discovery and set about building an instrument of his own. Now, this was the passage. Now, can you tell me which exact uh, sentence uh, indicates uh, which in uh, basically uh, and how this is changed. So, now you have covered the passage and now basically you have to indicate which of the following sentences is identical to the sentence in passage and which sentences are changed. So, he sent a letter about it to Galileo the great Italian scientist, Galileo the great Ita Italian scientist sent him a letter about it, a letter about it was sent to Galileo the great uh, Italian scientist and he sent Galileo the great Italian scientist a letter about it. Now, which of the ones is the uh, sentence that is exactly mentioned in the passage. Earlier, so I think uh, this one he sent a letter about the first one is basically the correct one. A lot of people kind of mix it, sentence one is the only one that is identical to the one in the passage. However, a lot of people identified numbers 3 and 4 as the matching as matching the one on the passage, even though the wording was different. Why are they doing this? It is just said right away. One of the reasons could be that these participants are apparently remembering the gist and the sentence's meaning, but not its exact wording. This is pretty much how we store information in the long term memory. Now, coming to long term memory and the brain. 
there have been neuropsychological studies about investigating things in the brain. The method of dissociations has been used in memory research to differentiate between short term memory and long term memory by studying people with brain damage that has affected one of these functions by sparing and sparing the other. So there could be patients whose short term memory is impaired but long term is intact, there might be patients whose long term memory is intact but short term memory is impaired. So uh, there was a very famous patient uh, called Henry Molaison uh, and uh, Glenn Humphreys uh, was a very famous uh, psychologist who worked with him all his life. Now, HM basically uh, and uh, Henry Molaison has been referred to as HM ever since. So, HM basically was having seizures and what happened was that uh, he, he was having these epileptic seizures and the doctors of that era, uh, they basically eliminated part of his uh, temporal, uh, uh, frontal temporal lobes wherein the memory was supposed to be there. So, that uh, operation that was basically uh, meant to eliminate his seizures also unfortunately eliminated his uh, ability to form new memories. Now, HM's unfortunate uh, situation occurred because in 1953, the surgeons did not realize that the hippocampus is crucial, the hippocampus got removed, so hippocampus is crucial for the formation of new long term memories. Once they realized the devastating effects of removing the hippocampus on both sides of his brain, HM's operation was never repeated on any other patient ever. Here is a picture of uh, Henry Molaison. He died recently, I think a few years ago, uh, while still being a subject of one of the studies. He, a lot of uh, memory research has been done uh, with the help of HM. Another way in which uh, long term memory has been studied is by using methods of neuroimaging. Some brain imaging experiments have demonstrated the activation of different areas of brain for short term memory tasks versus long term memory tasks. So, for example, Deborah Talmi and colleagues measured the fMRI response to tasks involving short term memory and long term memory. They first presented a list of words to participants, but instead of asking the participants to recall the words, they presented a single probe word. So, they are looking for recognition test. The probe uh, was either a word from near the beginning of the list or a word at the end of the list or a word that had not been presented earlier at all. The participant's task was to indicate whether the word has been presented before. So, a very simple task based on recognition memory. Now, their brain activity was measured with fMRI after the probe was presented and as the participants were preparing to respond. The results indicated whatever they found out with respect to brain activations indicated that the probe words that were from the beginning of the list uh, uh, you know uh, activated areas of the brain associated with long term memory and short term memory. Uh, because words at the beginning of the list would be in the long term memory and would then be transferred to the short term memory because they are being recalled. In contrast, the words at the end of the list only activated the areas from, uh, relevant to the short term memory because these words have not already got to the long term memory. Although Talmi's experiment demonstrates very well the activation of different areas for short term and long term memory, the results of many other experiments have not been really as clear cut. Now, you can uh, probably uh, uh, think that this might be the case because uh, short term and long term memories might not be as disconnected uh, from each other as a theoretical model would uh, you know make it to be. Uh, this is all about long term memory uh, and I hope uh, you uh, kind of uh, followed what long term memory is about and how it is important. Uh, in the next lecture, we will uh, start talking about some other aspects of memory. Thank you.